Hello and welcome to the Today's Homeowner Weekly Podcast. We're here to help you with the challenges we all face as homeowners. I'm Danny Lifford. And I'm Joe Truini. And each week, Danny and I are here on the podcast to answer any and all home improvement questions. And we want to hear from you. Send us your questions or comments at todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. Okay, Danny, let's get started. Today's Homeowner Podcast is brought to you by The Home Depot, How Doers Get More Done. This week, we have a special guest with us, Monique Allen, who just wrote a very interesting book about landscaping, even though the name of it is Stop Landscaping and Start Lifescaping. We have great information there that she provides for us. You'll want to hear that. Well, that's pretty timely, too, right? This time of year, everybody's thinking about going outside and fixing up their lawns and Uh gardens. Mm -hmm. And in that vein, I'm going to be sharing some uh, eco-friendly spring cleaning tips. If you're using chemicals and sprays to clean your house, you don't need to. More often than not, you can make your own at home with things you already have in the kitchen. And it's much less expensive, uh, not only better for the environment and better for you, uh, your health. Uh, it's a heck of a lot cheaper, so uh, uh, look forward to sharing those with you. Also, our podcast question of the week deals with stucco cracks. Just what can you do? Well, it's kind of complicated because Stucco has changed so much over the years from the um, hard masonry surface to actual foam board behind it, and depending on which you have in how you approach those cracks, but we have several options for this particular homeowner. And I'll share a simple solution on how to use an empty soda bottle to make a mini greenhouse for your new plantings. Oh, Joe likes to intrigue us with things like that. That's, (laughs) That's good. Looking forward to hearing about that, so let's get started going through all kinds of things want to you know encourage you to send us an email if you'd like anytime today's homeowner.com slash ask and we'll uh, get to as many emails as we possibly can a lot of recorded calls this week as well that we'll we'll try to tackle but uh, right now we are very happy to be joined by Monique Allen who is the founder and creative director of the Garden Continuum an award-winning landscape design build and fine gardening company she has 35 years experience as a gardener designer contractor and business owner i think she's about to get the hang of this gardening thing monique welcome to the today's home on the radio show Thank you, Danny. Yeah, I'm starting to get the hang of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I tell you, um, a very interesting um, a concept on your book. First of all, tell us a, a little bit of a, the overview of the book. I know you're very excited about it and getting a lot of uh, great press about the book. Uh, tell our listeners about it a bit. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, landscaping really is my life. So it's kind of weird that I wrote a book with the first two words of the title saying, Stop Landscaping. Um, <laughs> Uh, But what was happening for me is that, and I think for a lot of people, is that the industry has exploded. It's huge. And so it was getting kind of commoditized. It was going really fast, and people were kind of thinking of it as a thing, you know, kind of like their kitchen counter and their appliances. But the problem is it doesn't work that way, right? It's it's living. it's, It's actively moving and changing with the seasons. And so I realized that we had to kind of think about it a little bit differently. And so... I wanted to, to put the way I think about a landscape into sort of a codified book that would be just make it available to anybody who wanted to be in their yard or even people doing it as a business so they could really think about how to invest in their land in a way that really gave back to them. Well, well, certainly a garden enthusiast and those that really spend a lot of time out in the yard, uh, they're pretty passionate about it. And, you know, uh, so many times, and that means they seek a lot of information. And, you know, there's so many challenges out there. You're you're going along good. Everything's great. And a month later, all of a sudden, something's happening. So that, <laughs> you know, that, that information, and, you know, of course, the Internet provides a lot of information, but it, there's so many things out there now that are contradictory. So you, you read this. Okay, I got it. Oh. No, this contradicts. Uh oh, what what do I do? It's it's really hard to find that one source that can answer all of your questions that you have about your yard. It, it it there really is a lot out there, and probably one of the things that's difficult is that even though the concept of developing a landscape is mobile, right? It can be anywhere. This book is mobile. The the concept with it can can be read in any country. My my blog now is all over the world, which is so much fun when I get to talk to people like from South Africa. Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. But I can't tell somebody from South Africa what to do with plants, particularly, or like an insect. I can't really speak to their weather. So 
we have to combine our resources so that we've got resources that are that can go anywhere like this book but then also connect with things like your land grant university let's say uh where i am in in massachusetts we can connect with umass to get really really good pointed information about our area does that make sense yeah absolutely makes a lot of sense Yeah. And, Monique, that, and Monique, that leads me to think of um, extension services, which I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with that, because gardening and landscaping, as you mentioned, you know, it is pretty specific to where you live. And so it's hard to give general rules that apply to everyone. But extension services from universities and in, in, in each individual state usually has really good information as well that, um, you know, can make give you a little more detail on when to plant or what to plant. Right. Exactly. And, you know, like I'll just speak to UMass because, you know, I'm in Massachusetts, but it's it's wonderful. So when we have an issue, like when we had the issue of winter moss came up and it, it hit kind right. of hard and people just didn't know what to do with it. And now it's really it's receding, which is fabulous. Right. But, you know, the, it, things change and you can pop onto UMass Extension and you can look up a bug, you can look up a weed. Um, you can ask a specific question about soil or about soil testing and and get the best information that's actually really, it's actionable, which is the best thing for a gardener, right? Exactly. And I recently had a great encounter with a a county extension service where um, I actually had a soil test done for different areas of of my new yard. And then I got back at the report and I went, oh, Okay, well, um, I can understand about ten percent of this, but when I got the <laughs> I, I got the guy on the phone and he broke it all down and explained it, it was like, man, what? I, I just felt empowered by that because I knew exactly scientifically uh, what I needed to do to make it all work. Well, um, Monique, I tell you, it's a great that we're, to have you on the show. We'd certainly like to have you back again, maybe do some podcasting with you and so forth. But um, tell our listeners uh, how they can get a hold of your brand new book, Stop Landscaping and start livescaping. So the book is on pre-order right now. It goes live uh, on the 23rd, so you can pop on Amazon. If you're somebody who wants to uh, support local bookstores, uh, local booksellers, you can pop onto IndieBound.org, and then you can go to my website, and everything is there. Absolutely. Give us that website real quick, Monique. It is TheGardenContinuum.com. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you so much for being with us. We can always talk about the lawn and garden and a lot of different tips. We'll absolutely have you back as soon as we can. Awesome. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Joe. Okay. You're welcome. All right, absolutely. Bye. It really, uh, you know, makes you think about it, even though different parts of the country, the show's all over the country. And, uh, you know, in the south, uh, of course, we're getting closer and closer to that springtime. Up north, it's a little bit more to, to go, but still, there's so many things that you still can do right now in starting seeds, starting a, dif- a lot of different things like that. And there's a lot of information about all of that at todayshomeowner.com. It's time for our best new product segment brought to you by The Home Depot. How doers get more done. If there's someone in your house who always forgets to turn on the bath vent fan when they're showering, well, you know what a steamy mess that can make. You may not know that condensation will lead to mold, mildew, and a lot of other problems in your bathroom. Here's a solution. The Do Stop, and that's spelled D-E-W, the Do Stop Condensation Fan Control automatically turns your bathroom fan on when moisture is present and off when everything dries out. It replaces the existing fan switch and works with any ventilation fan. It includes adjustable humidity sensitivity settings so you can tailor your fan to your room's particular climate. It also includes an adjustable 0 to 60 minute timer and manual on and off control. The setting adjustments are concealed beneath the cover on the switch, so they're easily changed without removing the switch. This simple upgrade will help you prevent mold and mildew by turning your fan on automatically, even if what your family member forgets to do it. So for more information on the Do Stop Condensation Fan Control, log on to homedepot.com. Great way to um, prevent a lot of that mold and mildew that we hear about um, all the time. You know, when we're talking about this time of the year, everybody talks about spring cleaning. And, you know, you after all the winter and being cooped up inside, it is nice to maybe uh, take a room at a time and really clean it up very well. And, you know, if you listen to today's Homeowner Radio, um, you know that we talk a lot about natural 
type of cleaners and, you know, natural weed killers. Anytime that we can get away from some of the harsh chemicals and the outgassing that can occur with that, the expense that can happen with that, it's always a good thing. So I thought we would share a few things that you can do with three things you probably have in your kitchen right now. Of course, white vinegar, uh, baking soda, and lemon. So uh, one of the things, uh, Joe, that I, um, you know, we're always stumbling across these different things that work really right. well. Uh, I, I found one um, where you actually can take the lemon peels right. and uh, and then put that in with some vinegar and let it soak overnight and then use that and dilute it a little bit with water, put it in a spray bottle, and that's a great all-purpose cleaner. Just oh, le- lemon peels, vinegar, yeah. and then let that soak overnight, and then add a little bit of uh, water to it. That really does work very well. Yeah, I guess because a lot of the citrus acid, which is the cleaner, is in the peels, not that's only right. the juice. That's right. Um, and you can also, I, I think I shot a simple solution of this a uh, year or two ago for cleaning cutting boards and disinfecting surfaces around the kitchen. Take a, a lemon and slice it in half. Uh-huh. And then put the cut side down. You can actually add a little salt too, as um, as a little abrasive cleaning abrasive, and just scrub it. Squeeze a lemon and scrub it. And essentially, what you're doing is using that lemon juice again, that citrus acid, as a disinf- <clears throat> excuse me, a disinfectant and a cleaner to scrub those surfaces really clean. Now, Joe, you eat a lot of fish. Do you do you ever do. put do you ever put lemon? Do you do you squeeze lemon on your fish? Yeah, of course. Yeah, so, some people uh, I, I do every every time. Yeah. I, I love that, uh, but. Um, it probably worth pointing out if you're cleaning your um, cutting board with lemon, don't use that lemon on your fish. Yeah, don't use. Lemon. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, you're supposed to have separate. I know in professional kitchens, don't they have separate cutting boards for like fish, meat, and veggies because of the cross contamination? Let, let's you hope. Clean it let's really hope well. they do. Yeah, let's. Let's hope, hope they, do. they do. Let's hope they're cleaning anything back there. Yeah. Hey, um, and and who would think that you could use water to clean up any rust spots? Well, you can if you mix it with baking soda and just create a little bit of a paste and then rub it on whatever you need. Let it work just a little bit, and that is a real. Um, very lightly abrasive way of cleaning a lot of those uh, rust spots that you may have in your bathtub or your shower. So it works. Uh, it works most of the time. Sometimes they're a little more, um, you know, penetrated into the surface, and you might have to use a chemical. But uh, always use right. the baking soda and water uh, to try it out first. Yeah, and, and if you mix the baking soda with um, vinegar, you can use to disinfect your garbage disposal. Sometimes you get like a pretty funky smell out of those yeah, disposals because yeah. not everything, not everything you wash. You grind up and wash down gets through, right? So some yeah. of it remains behind. So yeah, try a little, um, sprinkle a little baking soda, pour in some vinegar, and stand back. That's right. It, it sounds like it looks like there's going to be a volcanic explosion, but yeah. it's just the fizzing. And then you know, run some hot water and obviously flip on the disposer. So that works well too. And you can also make. I was very proud of you, Danny. You said paste without saying your favorite word for paste. Poultice. Poultice. Danny loves saying. Poultice. I know. I don't know why that is. I like that. <laughs> but you can mix up a poultice, which is water and a thick and baking soda make a thick poultice to scrub you know grimy surfaces including um ovens you know clean um soot and uh, food spatters on ovens including inside your microwave yeah you know you mentioned the uh, garbage disposal definitely a right a, a source of smells in homes a lot and by, and by the way we always think of things that are kind of fun to do with your kids well put a chair there let your kid get on there and look in there let them pour the baking soda in and then have a cup of vinegar, and then let them pour that in. They will love that. They'll beg you. Right. Hey, hey, mom, dad, let's 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 clean the garbage disposal again today. So <laughs> you never expect to hear that from a, from a kid. But the the chemical reaction of it is very very interesting. But another source of smells potentially in your kitchen, the dishwasher, because it can get pretty funky right. as well. But I'll tell you, if you'll um, have an empty dishwasher, then take a saucer of white vinegar, straight white vinegar, and put it in there. Just set it in there and then turn it on. Then it disperses that um, a vinegar around. And of course, the, uh, the vinegar itself will absorb the smell and it'll clean the whole thing and really make it, uh, you know, improve the, the smell of it quite a bit. All of these tips I uh, shared with the um, live uh, segment that we did early this morning uh, with the Weather Channel and uh, on the Weather Channel quite a bit. So you um, can check us out. We'll always send out alerts on Facebook. So you can go by the Today's Homeowner Facebook page and sign up so that you 
won't miss a thing at all. And of course, when we talk about that dreaded chore of cleaning windows, um, right. this is something that I have used quite a bit is simply white vinegar and water, 50-50, put it in a, a nice clean spray bottle. And then I'll tell you what, get two spray bottles and two microfiber um, cloths and put one person outside, one person inside working on the same window. That way you're not going to miss anything inside or out. And then don't forget the screens and around the perimeter of it. And as we say a lot of times uh, on home improvement projects, yes, cleaning every window in your home could be a chore. But how about cleaning a third of them today and a third of them tomorrow and a third of them the next day that everything's nice and clean? If you do it right, you probably won't have to do it again for at least a full year. So a lot of little tips, a lot of simple ways, a lot of inexpensive ways that you can maintain what is probably your biggest investment, your home. Right now, we're going to go to Terry, who has a laminate flooring question. Terry, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, I have laminate flooring with a glossy surface, uh-huh. and I made a mistake of buying a Bono the man- for laminate floorings. Now I have a waxy buildup I can't get rid of. Huh. Well, um, hmm, that, that's really a good product um, for a lot of things. I, I associate it more with use on um, hardwood floors. Uh, Joe, do, do you know if they have a, something that, that, that's that's good for laminate? Yeah, most, uh, Terry, Bona is actually made really good. I'm, I'm glad you used it because it's actually is a really good, they have a great line of products. Most of them are for hardwood floors. They do make one specifically for cleaning laminate floors, and I assume that's the one you use, that Bona that's for laminate floor? Yes, yeah, sir, that's the one I use. Good. I'm not sure why there'd be a waxy buildup unless it was applied too thickly and not cleaned off, but it's 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 a relatively thin material to begin with, thin meaning from viscosity, meaning it's you know, it's not a thick pasty. Um do you see this what you call a waxy buildup on the entire floor that you cleaned or just in areas? On the entire floor. Yeah. Did you contact the manufacturer? What did they recommend? Well, I found the manufacturer information. I couldn't get a hold of them. They said uh, to clean it with alcohol. Okay. And so I, I tried that, but it'd be on the floor and constantly wiping it constantly. Yeah, yeah. What I was going to suggest, um, and you can test this in a spot. The good thing is that laminate floors are virtually indestructible when it comes to cleaning, as long as you don't use anything super abrasive on it you know you don't have to worry about damaging the surface if it was wood or polyurethane finish or something like that so i would try just in one spot a little danny and i often talk about white vinegar the power of white vinegar i would try cleaning a little spot with white vinegar and as i was on the phone with you i I went and i looked up the bona customer service hotline and give them a call tell tell them exactly what product you use and how you applied it and they should be able to help you out all right. Well, thank you. I will definitely try that. Sure, because they, they would be able to give you the exact information. You know, I'm not familiar with the f- laminate floor cleaner and why it would leave a buildup behind, but, but they should be able to help you out. All right. Well, I sure do appreciate it. Absolutely, you're, Terry. You're welcome, well, Terry. Well, best of luck on that. Hate that that happened, but I'm sure that'll uh, they'll, they'll be able to help you. It's a great company. All right. Well, thank you so much for your help. I do appreciate it. Okay. Our pleasure. Always encourage you to give us a ring at uh, 800-946-4420, the Today's Homeowner Hotline. Any type of question that you may have, comment or suggestion on, you know, a subject that you would like for us to dig into, we're always ready for that. And But right now, we, we love to, uh, to kind of um, handle a number of uh, recorded questions that people that called in on the Today's Homeowner Hotline this week didn't leave their name or number but I'm sure they're listening right now and would love an answer. Let's get started. I own a few homes, but the one that I live in always seems to be cold. So I got rid of the old furnace. I put an energy-efficient furnace in there. Um, I'm changing the windows out, insulating everywhere I can see the basement, the choice. And when I call the insulation company out to cut access into the attic so they can insulate, the guy measures and says that my second floor has a lot of dead between each wall, five to six feet behind each wall in the upstairs, except for the outside wall. My question is, is it wise to move the walls back and make the rooms larger and the bathroom larger? Or is it a reason that the builders made the home that way? 
Okay. Well, most likely you're talking about an area that's uh, where, um, like, basically attic space that's been converted to create the second level of the home. And a lot of times you'll have a wall, a pony wall on the side that'll be four foot, five foot, six foot um, tall, whatever. Now, if you expand, if you take that down and expand it back, it's really unusual, unusable space for the most part because then it's just getting so small you can't even put a chair in it. You're going to be bumping your head, that type of thing. So, it's really, and, and then you have electrical, you have um, um, sheetrock work, you got flooring. It's just not worth that little bit of extra square footage. Um, and pertaining to your home, I would suggest just what you're doing now in a more efficient furnace is going to help tremendously. Certainly windows is a first line of defense when you're talking about making your home cozier. And then, of course, the best money you can spend on your home is that attic insulation to be able to insulate as much of that attic as uh, everywhere you can. I don't care where you live in the country, you need at least 13 to 14 inches of insulation in that attic, and that'll that'll pay you back every single day of the year. Hello there, my name is Bill, and uh, I have a unique problem. I have plaster walls, and my wall vents, where they screw into the wall, all the plaster is chipped away or broken away, and I have no way to attach my vents to the wall. I'm just looking to see if there's some type of advice or maybe you know of a way to do that. Well, um, if I'm I, – I, without seeing this, it's hard to give you an exact idea. But what I would – first thing I thought about is if you remove the vents, reach inside the wall to the right and to the left and see if there's a smooth enough surface to mount a vertical 1 by 4 So what you're going to do is you're going to be putting in a piece of wood that allows you to screw into that. So you can just go right through the plaster wall. And and you probably have to get longer screws for the vent. But that would work, I think. So just cut short two by four, one by fours. You know, maybe they're eight or ten inches tall. Slip, put some construction adhesive, press them against the backside of the wall. Again, flush with the opening to the right and left. Um, Then secure it from the front with some screws, some drywall screws. And those screws position them so they'll be covered by the vent. Um, the flange around the vent, then just put the vent in place and use screws to screw straight through the plaster and into the one by four. So I think it's probably your best option. Yeah. Hi, I have a small bathroom of step in tub. That's also a shower right next to it is the toilet and across the, from the tub is a sink and it doesn't have a fan, but it has a window. I can't put a fan in because of the second floor, the steads go the wrong direction. The floor joists go the wrong direction for me to mount one. Um, and it's got a floor and everything up there. So I was wondering about a wall-mounted exhaust fan for the bathroom. Do you have any suggestions or any ideas or anything to help me out? Because I'm not that handy with wood. I'm handy with everything else on the planet, just not wood. (laughs) Okay, well, (laughs) he knows knows his limitations there, doesn't he? Um, Well, I'll tell you what, a wall-mounted exhaust fan for a bathroom is a great idea. Uh, They have those with uh, louvers on the outside that when not in use, it'll close down so that you're not getting any of the... uh, uh, hot or cold air coming in from outside. And then you have, um, a lot of times you can also have a humidistat on those if you want. But uh, yeah, it works very, very well. And it's um, generally, they're very small, less than a foot square. So that'll fit between the joists that you, the uh, studs that you would be working in there. The biggest challenge, of course, is getting electricity to that. An electrician is, uh, they're very used to routing wires inside existing walls. So you may find an outlet down below it that you're able to route up to, or you might be able to find another source of power that you can route to it. But I would definitely put one in. uh, um, You know, it used to years ago, the code would allow you to have a window in lieu of the fan. And uh, why in the world did that ever happen? I don't know, because it never will provide. Because you need to ventilate your bathroom and exhaust that hot, moist air, you know, 365 days a year. And if it's 20 degrees outside, you're not going to be opening that window when you're taking a shower and all you're going to do is capture all of that moisture so exhaust fan every single bathroom is really needed and it needs to exhaust all the way to the outside not just in the attic i'm calling asking a question about our metal roof that we have um we have the metal that the ice and the, the snow slide off of my question what is the best way to stop that falling ice and snow from hitting someone underneath a doorway. Yeah, that's one thing about metal roofs is they're great at shedding snow and ice, 
but sometimes if you get a lot of snow, you can get a, like an avalanche coming down, especially over a doorway. And they make specific products to hold the snow on the roof. They're called, there are two products. One's called a snow guard. And a snow guard, it's a little hard to explain, but it's just an L-shaped piece of metal and the, and the vertical part is sometimes shaped decoratively and you screw them in place you stagger them up and down the roof in rows and the idea is when the snow falls on the roof these little guards will hold it up until it melts and if and if you have a lot of snow and a really stiff peach pitched roof they also have a uh, something called snow rails snow rails are just little tiny look like little fences almost little metal fences with horizontal bars and they basically do the same thing they just hold back the snow so th those would be your two options snow guards or snow rails my question is how do you keep from having nail talk in areas that have moisture like a bathroom and an attached bedroom Hey, well, thank you very much thank for you. that. She's nice. calling from the um, subway. It yeah, like. it sounded yeah. a little loud there. But, well, 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 well first of all, um, again, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, uh, the exhaust fan cannot go in the attic. It has to go all the way to the outside. It can be routed to a gable vent, to a soffit vent, or a penetration through the roof. But it has to go out of there, and that will reduce the moisture there, and that should prevent any problem with the um, nail pops. Now, if you have a nail pop, no matter where it is, whether it's a result of moisture or whatever, uh, that nail needs to be removed. You generally can do that with a pair of needle nose pliers. Then replace it with a drywall screw and then recess it just slightly below the surface of the drywall and then you can patch over it with joint compound, then touch up the paint. Um, it's, you know, nails are nowhere near as good as screws and that will prevent those nail pops from reoccurring. But let's get that exhaust fan fixed first and then I think you'll be able to see um, a big improvement in the way those um, those those. Uh, particular fasteners are. Joe, you know, um, the the use of screws now in drywall is, uh, that, that's kind of one of those things. If you see guys doing nothing but nailing those the drywall up, boy, it's yeah. a big indicator that the quality is not going to be in that home. No, you absolutely have to use screws. That's why they invented drywall screws. Figure it out, right? You're putting up drywall. You have to use drywall screws. And be really careful and make sure you're hitting the center of that stud because if you, even if you're using a screw, often I'll find it looks like a nail pop. It's actually a screw pop. It's because it didn't quite hit the center of the stud and maybe it came off the side of the stud and it's not really biting into anything. There you go. That'll prevent you from having that kind of a cosmetic uh, eyesore that you might have around your home. It is so much fun being with you each and every week. And I particularly like this part of the show where I can just sit back, throw it to my buddy Joe Truini, and listen to another great simple solution. Give us one, Joe. All right. Sit back and listen. How about that? That's, you've got the easy job. Um, we talked about, um, you know, spring is sprung here and all across the country. People are starting to think about planting. And I did a simple solution not too long ago about how to use a recycled soda bottle to start plants indoors. But OK, once you do move them outdoors, you put the seedlings in the, in the ground. How do you protect them from frost? And here's a simple solution, again, using a recycled soda bottle. First, take a utility knife and just slice off the bottom of the bottle and then take the, the remaining part of the bottle and set it over the seedling, right? So you're creating like a little mini greenhouse right over each individual um, seedling. And these are, by the way, these are two liter soda bottles, um, you know, so they've got plenty of space on them. And what it do is during the day, it'll capture the sun's energy and the warmth and then if, which will help the plant grow really quickly, if it gets too hot, you can simply twist off the cap because sometimes it can get warm enough where it can damage the plant. So you just twist off the cap, let some of that heat es escape. But at night, I'd really recommend putting the cap back on just to protect it from the cold. And you just leave that on there and you'll see how quickly that seedling will grow. It'll fill up that entire um, interior of that bottle. And then at that stage, it's probably hardy enough. Long as you're past and you're pretty sure there's going to be no more hard frost, 
you can take the bottle off and the seedling will take off and you'll have a nice healthy plant. There you go. That's a great way to go. No matter where you are in the country, you can get started right. on improving that yard. It's another great simple solution. And you can see over 500 simple solutions at the Today's Homeowner website, todayshomeowner.com slash simple solutions. And uh, now it's time for our DIY project of the week. This one is four different ways to bring warm colors to a cold kitchen. Number one, paint the walls. You know, color schemes really play off of each other and can really tie a room together. So choose a color that'll enhance the other colors that you already have in the room. And number two, try updating the flooring. You can replace drab faded linoleum with natural sandstone, which can bring new life to an old kitchen. Sandstone warms up a room because it has brown, yellow, gold, and red in it. Really nice earth tones that can warm up a space. Another thing that can make a big impact, probably the biggest impact in your kitchen, is painting the cabinets. Painting your cabinets uh, is the easiest and most affordable way it really does change a kitchen. And finally, number four, add splashes of color. Even small changes can make a big impact. So consider window treatments, decor, even appliances can add splashes of color in the kitchen. In the kitchen, For instance, luxurious curtains add texture and warmth to an otherwise cold, sterile room. There's another project of the week, a pretty easy one that you can tackle and make a big difference in your kitchen. Hey, let's roll right into our podcast question of the week from Rick. Rick writes, I have an older home that's 60 plus years old and has uh, superficial cracks in it. And I'm wanting to paint the house, but I'm afraid the cracks uh, you know, are showing through whatever I've been able to do. I worked in construction for a long time and commercially I've seen stow or drive it systems used on commercial building is that something I could just use over the stucco well I'll tell you what um, I, I, boy unless there's some real settlement cracks there Joe that um, where you have active movement you know most cracks are just that uh, expansion and right. contraction that are that are fairly small it sure, would sure seem extreme to try to put another stucco coating an entire new system over an existing one no, and Rick mentions are superficial cracks. And the plaster, or in this case, the stucco, rather, is not cracking and falling off. Um, but it, 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 he is smart to repair these because you don't want them to get worse if water gets in there and starts dissolving it, especially if it freezes and expands. Um, typically, it cracks up to about an eighth, an in, eighth of an inch. You can, I would vacuum it out, brush it out, get any of the loose debris out. Then they make sand-textured caulk that, um, so when it dries, has a little bit of texture, almost like like um, the stucco surface, and I'd put that in there to smooth it with a wet finger. You can also use siliconized caulk. I use siliconized caulk a lot, and that's latex, excuse me, latex-based caulk that has a little bit of silicone in it because 100% silicone, first, it's pretty expensive, but you have to clean it with um, mineral spirits. Um, with siliconized caulk, it's an acrylic product, so you mm -hmm. just use a latex product, you just clean water, use it, water to clean it up. But anyway, so that's what I would do. I'd fill lo all those cracks because you do want to take care of them. And one thing you can't do, and Rick probably knows this, you can't paint over cracks and hope the paint no, it them. won't do it. Paint's it not might, that it thick. It might look like it's going to cover it when you first <laughs> roll it on, but it's never going to. So that's what I would recommend. Just get get a good quality exterior grade caulk and fill those up. And the thing about it, that that caulk uh, has the el elasticity to it so that it'll right, remain exactly. flexible if that, you know, is continuing to move. That's okay. It'll move with it and that crack won't re reform. But uh, one tip there is when you're cutting the tip, a tip of a tip, uh, on <laughs> your caulking tube, um, cut it very, very small so that when you're injecting that caulk, just a small bead comes out. But you really don't want too much caulk in there. You want to fill the crack, but you don't want it to overflow and have to do all of that cleaning, and that will end up showing up more than it does now. Plus but, you're wasting you know, caulk. Yeah, plus you're wasting a lot of caulk. Yeah. So that should take care of it, Rick. Hope that helps you, and uh, we don't want you to have to put a whole new system on the outside of your house. Just some diligent caulk and some good acrylic latex text paint after that and I think it'll look brand new. Hey, we would love to hear from you if you would like to send us a question. All you have to do is go to todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. And thanks so much for the great remarks we've gotten over this past week. And you know, really, uh, since we uh, kind of relaunched the podcast uh, several months ago, we, we really appreciate all of those uh, thoughtful comments and fantastic reviews we've been getting. Keep them coming. I'm Danny Lippert along with Joe Troini. That pretty much wraps up our podcast for this week. We'll see you soon.